Szanowni Panie i Panowie, Ladies and Gentlemen, Wit imene Naukowo Towarzystwa imene Szewczenka w Kanadii, witaju wszystkich Was na spilni imprezie Blasztowani razem z Ukraińskim Kanadzkim Doświadczo Dokumentacyjnym Centrum. Ja nazywam się Daria Darewicz i mnie jak głowi Towarzystwa przypala przyjemność przywitać wszystkich Was na czerwowej dopowiedzi w Toronto. I would like to welcome all of the panelists, participants, and guests on behalf of the Shevchenko Scientific Society of Canada and the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center in Toronto. Radiemo, što do nas dolučili še člene tovaristva i hosti ne tih iz Toronto, ali tako z okolič iz riznih mist Kanade, Amerike i Evropi, Na tu poru mi vže je na sto dešet, tak što je nadzvečajne číslo. Osobljivo vitaju organizatora i golovnoho dopovidača, panju Kalenu Beshlibnik Butler, jaka bila inicijatorom projektu, vitšukala i zaprosila do učasti na ščatki v žinok, što boli uvjazneni koncentracijnom v tabori Ravinsbrug. A special welcome to Kalina Beshlibnik Butler of the UCRDC, who undertook to organize the presentation on Ukrainian victims of the Ravensbrück concentration camp, as well as to the children of those victims who agreed to participate. Korestaju zahodi, šo podate do viduma, šo višim najčetoho beresnja, vid budeća tradicijna, še učenkivška dopovi NTS, na temu kanonični obraz Ševčenka i spohade pro njoho. Je jive holosej, dr. Herhori Hrabovič, vidomi literaturoznavič, profesor katedri imene Dmitra Čeževško v Hrvati. Čikavi dopoviti takoš za planovanje v osredkah tovarestva v Edmontoni in Montreali. Prošu šitkovati za elektronnemi povidomljenjami. Prehaduju, še inženjer Oleš Donečki, član direkciji zapisuje vši dopoviti in do njih je dostup na YouTube kanali NTS čez website tovarstva ntsh.ca. Tam za tre četiri dni znajdete zapis in preze še hodni. Please be reminded that all of the NTS lectures are recorded and are available for viewing on the Taras Ševčenko YouTube channel, which can be reached through the ntsh.ca website. A link will also be available on the UCRDC website. In Chayuchi, Jakuju Chlenam Direkciji, Pani Hristi Kolos za Ohološenja, in Ženerove Olesa Vidonečkomu za Omožljivljenja dopovide na Zoom. Rivnož Jakuju za spilpraču in Ohološenja Kongresovi Ukrinči v Kanade, v Toronti televizijnim programom Kontakt i Forum in radijevi programi Pisnja Ukrajine. Do predstavljanja pani Kalene Besklibnik Butler je poprošla holubu Ukrajinsko-Kanačko došičo dokumentacijno centru dr. Irenu Revučku. Now I would like to invite the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center, Ms. Irena Revučka, to introduce Kalena Beshlibne Butler. Prosh. Štiro djakuju, pani je doktor Darević. Mušu priznati se, što ja ne je doktor, ali djakuju za tito. Good afternoon, dobroho dnja, bonjour. Thank you very much for joining for today's webinar. Um, my name is Irina Rabutsky, and I am the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center. The Research and Documentation Center is a community institution which collects, catalogs, and preserves materials documenting the history, culture, and contributions of Ukrainians throughout the world. The Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center is honored to co-present this lecture on the women of Ravensbrück with the Shevchenko Scientific Society. 
I am very pleased this afternoon to introduce our guest speaker, Kalina Betsklipnik Butler. Kalina is a retired pharmacist and spent most of her professional career as the director of pharmacy at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, known as CAMH. Following her retirement from CAMH, Kalina performed clinical drug consultations at the Ukrainian Canadian Care Center in Toronto. She was on the board of the Children of Chernobyl Canadian Fund, where until 2019, she served as the head of the Medical Advisory Committee. Kalina began her interest in the women of Ravensbrück at the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center as a volunteer in 2019, where her professional skill set was put to good use. At the Research and Documentation Center, Kalina initially began to archive the memoirs of her father, Vasil Solominka, and her first father-in-law, Vasil Veskhlivnik, who were both members of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Once Kalina's work was completed on these memoirs, at the suggestion of Irohida Vinnitska, who I proudly describe as the irreplaceable original driving force of the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center Archive Committee, Kalina was asked to review the oral history files at the center about women's, women prisoners at the Ravensbrück concentration camp. In these files, Kalina discovered the names of several Ukrainian women. Kalina then expanded her research about Ukrainian women prisoners at Ravensbrück by consulting published materials and by locating information on the internet. Her research led her to conclude no list of Ukrainian women prisoners existed. Being data-driven, Kalina created a database documenting the names of Ukrainian women prisoners who were incarcerated at Ravensbrück. Kalina intends to continue her work on the database by adding the names of other Ukrainian women imprisoned at Ravensbrück as her research unfolds. Kalina's updated list of names will be posted on our website, so please have a look. Given her research, Kalina believes the women of Ravensbrück, the horrific, inhumane experiences and living conditions they endured at the Ravensbrück camp during the Second World War is deserving of public attention and recognition. By shining a light on this tragic episode of history, Kalina with her research pays tribute to the many women's lives which were needlessly lost and honors the memory of Ukrainian women who by their resilience, resourcefulness and group spirit against all odds, survive the atrocities of Ravensbrook. Ladies and gentlemen, Pagi Ipanove, Madame and Monsieur, Kalina Veslipnik Butler. Proshu, Pani Kalina. Igamu. Kaku Ileno, thank you. And Hochi Pitati Sikrosotnech Tadachius, Canadis, Americas, Europe, Ukraine, Hanavik is Australia. When I was asked to summarize the memoirs of Ukrainian women imprisoned at Ravensbrück, to be honest, I had never heard about Ravensbrück, nor, would it, nor was aware that it was a concentration camp for women. So working on this project, I jotted down the names of other Ukrainian women who were mentioned in the oral histories, and I became curious about them. So I began to do some research. I searched the internet to learn about Ravensbrück and was surprised to find that some references suggested that up to 8,000 Ukrainian women were imprisoned there. So who were they and why were they imprisoned? I reached out to Natalia Barikina at the Petroyatsik Resource Center at the Robarts Library, University of Toronto and to Anna Skorupski at the Eckstein Holocaust Resource Library. 
both librarians provided me with reference texts and advised me in how to search for names of prisoners at Ravensbrook. Internet searches provided me with access to databases of prisoners who were at this camp. More recently, I have received references from the Ravensbrück Memorial Museum in Germany. On its website, the UCRDC put out a search for individuals who had family members imprisoned at Ravensbrück. One of our co-presenters responded to this request. She contacted me and provided contact information for other family members. So at this point, I want to introduce my co-presenters who later in the presentation will provide you with personal stories about their mother's incarceration at Ravensbrück. Christia Elieschowska Treby from France and Lida Elieschowska Reptanska from Ottawa, Ontario are daughters of Olha Trulak Elieschowska. Oksana Marciuk from Hamburg, Germany and Orisha Marciuk from London, England are daughters of Lida Okarama Marciuk. Mark Infeld from Maryland, USA is the son of Zoriana Labi, who was one and a half years old when imprisoned with her mother, Daria Natvyska Labi, at Ravensbrück. Mark's grandmother and great aunt were also prisoners. To orient our audience to Ravensbrück, what I would like to do now is show an eight minute video about the camp. But before I do this, I wanted to mention that if anyone has a question during this presentation, please type it in under the chat or Q&A icon on your screen. Lida Reblanska will collect the questions and we will respond to them at the end of the presentation. Olish, can you please run the video? Germany at the end of the 1930s. The Nazi party came to power and planned to establish a new order in Europe. Apart from eliminating the political opposition within Germany, their main goal was to establish a community of the German people based on racial and anthropological principles. Those who did not fit this Aryan purity were to be taken out of society. Dozens of work camps were built to house the prisoners and Ravensbrück, 100 kilometers north of Berlin, was the Nazi regime's central concentration camp for women. From 1938 to 1945, over 100,000 women and children from more than 30 countries were deported to the camp. Offenders were organized and classified by a system of colored triangles to be worn on their person. The black triangle, reserved for work shirkers or those deemed antisocial elements. This group included gypsies and prostitutes. Purple for Jehovah's Witnesses. Ravensbrück housed male prisoners as well, and the pink triangle was exclusively designated for male homosexual prisoners. The red triangle was worn by the largest group, the political prisoners. Many of them had been active in the resistance or had refused to perform forced labor for the Germans. Jewish prisoners wore the yellow star with a second triangle pointing downward to complete the Star of David. Surprisingly, Ravensbrück held relatively few Jewish prisoners until 1944, when Auschwitz and other camps were evacuated and Germany was in the process of liquidating the prisoners. I grew up in the Fairfax district of Los Angeles, which was lovingly called the Borscht Belt, 
And it was called the Borscht Belt because there were so many immigrants, many of them still from the Holocaust, who had immigrated here. And I went to school with children of Holocaust survivors. And many of my friend's parents had numbers on their arms. And as a little child, you don't really know what it is. You kind of know a little bit about it, but not that much. There were four SS-run companies at Ravensbrück in which prisoners were forced to work. The largest among them was the textile and leather recycling company, Texled, where prisoners made uniforms for the SS. Some women making socks deliberately made the heels too narrow or defective in other ways so that the soldiers would get blisters on their feet. In 1942, the Siemens and Hauske Company established a production facility at Ravensbrück, later transferring its entire telephone production work to the camp. Amazingly, this company, which manufactured arms for the Nazi regime, is still in existence today. Despite the horrific conditions, friendships developed and secret cultural or religious activities often helped prisoners to preserve their human dignity and will to survive. Numerous works of art were produced despite strict bans and adverse conditions in the camp. Prisoners made drawings and wrote songs, poems, or prayers. Children were forced to work from the age of 12, while the younger ones played games like Roll Call, Selection, and SS. At 10 of their concentration camps, the SS established prisoner brothels as an incentive for male prisoners. The women who were forced into prostitution at these brothels were recruited from Robinsbrook. Many women volunteered for brothel detail because they hoped it would increase their chances of survival. Under the supervision of Carl Gebhardt, the use of sulfonamides to treat gas gangrene was tested on a group of Ravensbrück prisoners, who later became known as the rabbits. Gebhardt's researchers deliberately infected prisoners with gas gangrene by wounding them and contaminating the wounds with soil, splinters of wood, glass, or pus, and then testing them with various sulfonamide drugs. Similar experiments took place in the Dachau concentration camp. Between June and December of 1944, as the Allies were gaining a stronghold, more than 52,000 women from other camps were taken to Robinsbrook. In early 1945, the SS murdered between 5 and 6,000 prisoners, most of them women, in a provisional gas chamber that was built at the camp. In the spring of 1945, with the Russian army approaching, the SS began to evacuate the camp. They started by murdering prisoners who were sick or no longer able to walk. Around the same time, the Swedish and International Red Cross managed to gain permission from the SS to evacuate prisoners to neutral countries. The first Red Army unit arrived at the Robinsbrook camp on April 30th, 1945. The Soviet troops found around 2,000 seriously sick prisoners whom the SS had left behind. Although they repaired the water and electricity lines that had been destroyed by the SS and provided food and medication, they also raped many of the women. It is estimated that 30,000 people, women, as well as men and children, had died at Robinsbrook. It's believed the people in the town of Furstenberg did know. How could you not know? It would be almost impossible to live this close to a concentration camp and not know what was happening. I mean, you could smell it. They didn't have the power to do anything about it. But today, we see things happening globally, and this time, we do have the power to do something about it.
I trust that this short video gave you a glimpse of what life was like for women at Ravensbrück. Their individual stories are horrific and difficult to imagine. <laughs> On the UCRDC website, I have included references I used when researching Ravensbrück for those who, who may be interested in delving further into this topic. It's located in the menu section under archive textual photo ref references and World War II. trying to get this to uh, to go and my screen is forbidding me to do that. Okay, hold on, slideshow. Okay, here we go. Ravensbrück was located in what was later Eastern Germany, north of Berlin and north of Sachsenhausen. It was actually built by male prisoners from Sachsenhausen and opened in 1938. Ravensbrück had a close working relationship with other concentration camps in the area, specifically Buchenwald. And many women prisoners were moved back and forth between the camps. Ravensbrück was established initially for female enemies of Hitler's regime. The Nazis needed a place for special female prisoners, such as spies, political prisoners, French resistance fighters, Polish aristocrats, Scandinavian nationals, Jehovah Witnesses, Jews, and individuals they considered social outcasts, such as gypsies, lesbians, and prostitutes. As the Nazis destroyed many documents and records, the estimated number of prisoners held at Ravensbrück and the number of people who died there vary depending on the references, but it is suggested that between 120,000 and 130,000 women from 30 different nationalities were imprisoned in Ravensbrück. Up to 90,000 women died from disease medical experimentation from frost, starvation, beatings, executions, lethal injections, and in the crematorium. As for camp records, 2,500 men also died there. Men had their own barrack at the camp and were used to perform heavy labor. Specific records show that in the first three months of 1945, as the war was coming to an end, there was wholesale extermination of prisoners due to overcrowding at the camp and to wipe out evidence of atrocities committed there. Many were shot, others sent to gas chambers on site and to Mauthausen and Bergen-Belsen. The Red Cross was able to evacuate most Scandinavian and Western Europeans, but remaining women who could walk were taken on a death march to the Baltic. By the time the Russian army arrived in Ravensbrück in April, only 3,500 women remained at the camp. In 1942, there was a forced labor decree by Nazi command to round up recruits from occupied territories and deport them to Germany to work. They were called Osterbeiters. Ravensbrück changed from a protective custody camp to a slave labor camp. By 1943, Ravensbrück became a major administrative and working enterprise with over 40 subcamps located near factories that produce munitions, chemicals, aircraft parts, electronics, textiles, etc. As I mentioned earlier, Ravensbrück had a close working relationship with Buchenwald and many women at Ravensbrück were sent to work in their factories. Other women worked doing heavy labor on the camp 
property. According to historical records, the largest group of female prisoners was Polish at 30%. Russians and Ukrainians made up 21 to 30%, followed by Germans, Austrians, Hungarians, French, Belgian, Swedish, and Danish women. There were even 12 British women at the camp, including a relative of Winston Churchill. The number of Jews was about 15%. I was curious as to who were these Ukrainian women and when were they sent to Ravensbrück. Certainly there were some imprisoned in 1940 and 1941, caught in the Nazi sweep of enemies of Germany who were living in Poland and other European territories. However, starting in 1942, we see an increase in women taken from Ukrainian territories of the former Soviet Union. The women came from different walks of life. The mass, vast majority were those captured and taken from cities, villages, and towns as forced laborers to work in different German enterprises. Many were in their late teens or 20s, but some were older, married, and with children that were left behind. Starting in 1943, there were massive arrests by the Gestapo of Ukrainian political activists, and many were sent to different concentration camps. There are over 60 women in my database who were imprisoned due to their involvement in anti-Nazi activities, including OON. Ukrainian students studying in Germany, Austria, and Poland were also taken, some for their political views. Most were used as forced labor. Captured Red Army, military, and medical personnel were imprisoned here. I have identified approximately 100 Ukrainians in this group. In 1944-45, there were massive transfers from other concentration camps, including many Ukrainian and Jewish women. I stated earlier that 21 to 30% of prisoners were identified as Ukrainian or Russian, and about 30% as Polish. The problem with these numbers, however, is that during the Second World War, there was no Ukrainian state. Most Ukrainians from Western Ukraine region were listed as Polish, those from Eastern Ukraine as Russians, and from Zakarpatia listed as Czech, Romanian, or Hungarians. This was a challenge when I reviewed documents or databases, so I focused on place of birth of the woman. However, this information was not always available. So I want to give you an example. This is a transfer list to Ravensbrück, and in the left-hand column you will notice the nationality of the person is listed. The first two and the last two are listed in, as Ukrainian. And however, these people, others were born in Ukraine, such as Kirovograd, Kamyonets Podiski, Zhetomir, Zaporizhia, Kharkiv. So the actual nationality is listed on documents was very dependent on the person who was taking, who putting down the original record. This is another example. It's a registration document at Ravensbrück of Katerina Soloveiko, who was born in Poltava. She was a student and taken in Koln, and she was arrested and sent to Ravensbrück to do labor here. Later sent to Buchenwald to learn to do labor. If you take a look here, her language spoken Ukrainian However, her documentation is Russian, so she was given a red triangle with an R on it. Just one more example of a transfer document to Ravensbrook. And here, there was no uh, area where they were born. All of them are listed as Russian, except for the last one as Ukrainian. However, other documents show me that Lida 
Alexander was born in Yekaterinburg, and Katya Shuvihar was born in Pirovohrad. So you can appreciate how difficult it was to try to identify Ukrainians in this group. All prisoners claiming to be Ukrainian or Russian were considered to be political, whether or not they had any political leanings. And many were from Eastern Ukraine and were Ostrobiters. All were given a red triangle plus an initial for their nationality. U for Ukrainians was rarely used as prisoners were identified as to what territory they were shipped from. So most were given an R or a P. Some Ukrainians refused to, to wear the R and P on their triangle and tried to obliterate it. SU was worn by Soviet Union women in the Red Army. It is unknown how many Ukrainian women were incarcerated at Revensbrook but estimates range up to 8,000 individuals. My database contains names of less than 4,000 women so far, and it's based on documents where women were either self-identified as being Ukrainian or those that were born within the traditional borders of Ukraine. When combining my database, I wanted to ensure that every name was referenced by the source I used. Sometimes the information was detailed. Other times I just got a name, a date, a place of birth, and perhaps a prisoner number. The above examples that I showed you demonstrate how difficult it was to identify Ukrainian women amongst the thousands of documents available. The database and the references are, I used are on the UCRDC website for those who may be interested. So I want to show you some examples from the database. I began with the names of women that were mentioned in the oral histories that we had on file at the UCRDC. And then I searched for more information on these women. So this is an example of women considered to be political activists, mostly taken from Ukrainian publications. And depending on the source used, sometimes the information was more detailed than others. So what I tried to include in, is the date they were interned at Ravensbrook, the prisoner number, which you can see was not always available, where and when they were born, details of their imprisonment, including transfers to or from other camps, as well as the category of prisoner they were in and the references. This information on these prisoners was found on a Jewish database entitled The Jewish Women Prisoners of Ravensbrück, Who Were They?, published in 2007. The Jewish community has been very diligent in compiling databases of all their people incarcerated in concentration camps during the Second World War. I was able to access several of their databases to find names of women that came from Ukraine. By far, the majority of information I have found came from an online database called Errolson Archives. It contains camp registration records and prisoner transfer lists. One can search by concentration camp, by a person's name, or a prisoner number. There is a lot of information to sift through, and there are gaps in the information, as many documents were destroyed by the Nazis. The vast majority of names are of women taken as labor to work in factories. You know, interestingly, Arrowson Archives has an initiative called Every Name Counts and is building a digital archive of all concentration camp prisoners. Names of Red Army prisoners came primarily from a book in Russian, and I did need help with translating that text. One interesting thing I learned was when the Red Army women were freed and repatriated to the Soviet Union, 
many were charged with treason and sent to the gulag as punishment. German documents and lists were another source of Ukrainian names. This reference in particular was challenging to read as it listed names of prisoners who died during captivity. All of these women on my list were identified as Ukrainian. Unfortunately, at times, the method of their death was also included. You will notice that there is a baby on this list. Pregnant women were also imprisoned in Ravensbrück. Many were admitted following the Polish uprising of August 1944. Between September 44 and April 45, 600 babies were born at Ravensbrück, but only 40 survived. My database continues to be a work in progress and there are still files to complete. And I plan to update it periodically on the UCRDC website. I encourage any of our listeners who may be aware of individuals or information that can contribute to this database to contact UCRDC by email at office at ucrdc.org. Now, before I turn this presentation over to descendants of women who were imprisoned at Ravensbrück, I wanna show you an example of how resilient many prisoners were and how they attempted to try to live a normal life despite the horrendous circumstances at the camp. This was sent to me by a niece of Lubo Shochu who lives in Australia. It is a photo of pages of a tiny address book that Lubo made and hid in the hem of her prisoner dress. She wrote the names and addresses of prisoner friends she wanted to stay in touch with after the war. And I understand that she did keep in touch with a few of them. I will now turn the presentation over to Hristia Ileshauska Trevi. Thank you. Yakuyu Kalin. My name is Kristina Leshevsky, daughter of Olha Olak Leshevsky, who was incarcerated as a political prisoner in Nazi prisons and Ravensbrück concentration camp from December 11th, 1943 to April 5th, 1945. In 1940, my mother was enrolled at the University of Vienna. She was a member of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and with other students took part in political and cultural activities. On December 11th, 1943, she was arrested by the Gestapo and taken to a prison in Wels, Austria. She was accused of transporting weapons to Ukrainian insurgents. She was locked in solitary confinement and subjected to savage beatings by the Gestapo police. After several weeks of interrogation, Mama was transported to a larger prison in Linz, the Gestapo regional headquarters. The beatings continued, causing severe injury to Mama's head, ears, and kidneys. These traumas, painful headaches, and constant humming in both ears stayed with her for the rest of her life. The prisoners were herded onto a freight train and taken to Ravensbrück. Upon arrival, they were forced to strip naked, their belongings were confiscated, and their heads were shaved. They were ordered into the shower room. A medical team examined them to see if they were fit for work. And they were given a striped prison uniform with a symbol and a number on the front and back. My mother received a red triangle. Political prisoner number 49601. All human identity was forever erased. Mama was housed in one of the 200 barracks in the camp. There were about 300 prisoners per barrack with three tier bunks where the women slept two to a bed. The days were long and monotonous. 
wake up call at 4 a.m., a meager breakfast of watery coffee and a slice of moldy bread, roll call at 5 a.m., and a long march to the hidden Siemens plant, which manufactured spare parts for German aircraft. Then return to camp at 5 p.m., roll call, watery soup for dinner, and lights out. All inmates were closely monitored at all times by the Kapo guards. Mama recalled that the most difficult time was the dreaded daily roll call. The women had to stand outside under the hot sun and freezing temperatures until, <coughs> excuse me, until all the names had been read out. Many elderly inmates often fell to the ground, ground and the guards showing no mercy, insulted them, kicked them and beat them with truncheons. Some women went mad and to end their misery threw themselves on the electrified barbed, barbed wire surrounding the camp. This gruesome scene of lifeless bodies on barbed wire greeted the inmates each morning as they assembled for roll call. Mama never spoke to us children about her experiences during the war and at Ravensbrück. I believe she was deeply scarred by her imprisonment. And when she was released, she made a conscious decision to put everything behind her. Family and career became her immediate focus and participation in social and plus events in the Toronto Ukrainian community. She avoided political events, but did remain a lifelong member of the World League of Ukrainian Political Prisoners. She never returned to visit Ravensbrück. Only later in her life was she able to speak about Robin, Ravensbrück. In 1982, she participated in the oral testimony project of the Multicultural Historical Society of Ontario. She prevented powerful oral testimonies about her early life in Ukraine, incarceration at Robinsbrook, and immigration to Canada. Also, with my father's encouragement, she wrote five memoir articles about Robinsbrook that were published in various Ukrainian Canadian media. This past year, my sister Lydia and I decided finally to translate Mama's five memoirs into English with the realization that time was passing quickly and that Ravensbrück is indeed the forgotten camp. There was an urgency to inform the world and memorialize the suffering of Ukrainian women in Nazi prisons. These memoirs have now been published online on Euromaidan Press and are also listed in the references of this webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. I would now like to introduce the next speaker, Oksana Marcuk. Oksana. Sorry. Okay. In the fall of 1942, Lida Okarma was an economic student in Berlin. She had just finished an exam when she was about to leave for Vienna with her luggage, fur coat and an elegant hat when she was arrested by the Gestapo. For half a year, she was interrogated and beaten in Berlin Alexanderplatz. Without being given a trial, Lida Ukarma was transported along with other Ukrainian women to Ravensbrück in the spring of 1943 for her political activities. Jehovah's Witnesses handed out prison uniforms to the new incoming prisoners. Surprisingly, this group, of which my mother was a member, didn't have their heads shaved. Being shaved bald was one of the most degrading treatments newcomers had to suffer. To avoid being labeled as Polish or Russian, she insisted on having a red triangle without an initial indicating nationality. 
Lida was taken to block five with Olena Vitek and later on block three. Lida's work was to level the streets leading to the Siemens Heizgewerke. Here you see one of the really heavy steamrollers in front of the crematorium. There were even bigger steamrollers than this one. It was extremely hard work. Half a year later, she was working at Siemens Heizke. Because of her knowledge in bookkeeping, she was soon allocated to the civilian Siemens employee's office. A year later, she was told secretly that she would be liberated soon. On the 4th of October, 1944, she was freed. Lida was given back all her elegant clothes, as well as the Madonna, which she was given back in Berlin by the priest, Dr. Verhoon, who was later beatified by Pope Voitela. I have left out details about the special connections my mother had with other prisoners, as well as the countless pleas or her journey to Munich via Berlin after her early liberation. Lida arrived in Munich the spring of 1945, looking for Ukrainian survivors of Dachau and providing them with food and accommodation. She was the one who convinced US soldiers to hand over the Nazi casino to Ukrainian survivors. It became the main address for most Ukrainian prisoners and refugees in Munich, Dachauer Straße number nine. And now I hand over to my sister, Orisha. Here she is. Good evening, thank you very much. When my mother told me that she had been in Ravensburg concentration camp, I so simply could not believe that. Concentration camps were for Jews, communists, Roma, homosexuals, criminals, but not for my elegant mother, who did not even have a number tattooed on her arm. Like the doubting Thomas, I needed proof. Back at home, she showed me these figures, which she had been given by her friend in the camp, Olena, Fick, uh, Olena Vitek, I'm sorry. That made it finally tangible. Knowing from school how badly prisoners were treated in concentration camps, particularly how scarce food was, I immediately grasped the significance of the medallion from the material. I wondered how much bread must Olena have chewed and resisted in swallowing as to produce this memento. A slice? What does a slice mean when you fed too little to live and too much to starve? Both sides are decorated, one with a trisop, the symbol of the then not yet existing Ukrainian state, and the other with St. George and the dragon. Given my mother's background as fierce supporter of an independent Ukraine, both symbols go obviously hand in hand. In preparation to this presentation, however, I began to understand this miniature beyond its affirmation of national identity, as powerful tool of resistance and sabotage. Does not the saint invoke fighting the evil with a weapon? Both Olena the maker and Lida the receiver must have been acutely aware that the creation and receipt of such a memento expressed unsanctioned behavior in terms of the camp administration and would have exposed both of them to severe punishment if caught. This small cross is made from the handle of a yellow toothbrush. Until 1943, the prisoners were given a blanket, a bowl, a wooden spoon and a toothbrush. So to see an item made from its handle was not too much a surprise. But this has a hole as if to be worn around the neck. Religious expression was forbidden by the camp administration. To make or own a cross at camp was surely an offence severely punishable. Apart from its obvious connotation with Christianity, this fragment of a cross, again made from this most precious material, bread, makes it stand out as an important expression of physical and spiritual resistance. To even receive a cross as token of friendship would have exposed the owner to severe punishment, even death. But how many, bites did, how many bites of bread did Olena have to resist swallowing 
in the face of starvation in order to produce the cross and the beads to go around the neck? How much discipline, commitment, determination and strength did it take to forfeit the most human urge to satisfy one's hunger and to create a cross from the bread which Christ broke with his disciples in his last supper? Is this not a Eucharist in reverse? One might dismiss this little flower as less significant as it does not carry the symbolism of the material, nor that religious connotation. However, its green color evokes hope, particularly in the monochromatic overcrowded environment of the camp, which would not have been lost neither to the maker nor the receiver. We must not forget that in a system which was designed to dehumanize and de-individualize, de even the smallest possession was regarded as wealth or treasure. You had to protect it from being stolen or having it betrayed by co-prisoners seeking petty favors. Property as a significant means of preservation, one's dignity and identity in such dire circumstances. Finally, I want to share with you the most personal moment of this, uh, of this series, which without doubt bears witness to a special relationship between these two women. On its face, we see the fighters and George and the dragon. On it, uh, it is its backside which draws acute attention with its description in Ukrainian in minuscule letters. From days spent together in captivity to Litka from Olenka. This object is interesting twofold. Obviously, it is an expression of hope for a future outside the camp and a memento for the time after the camp. This is also the only item which does not accommodate a string, so it is intended not to be worn around the neck but may be kept in the pocket. Perhaps it was intended as an expression for remember. That means computing the memory step by step after the present imprisonment was left in the past. And again, it is a reminder to continue the fight of St. George. Let me conclude that these items, as touching as they are on an individual basis, were in context of the life of life defying system of the concentration camp, a significant means of maintaining intellectual strength, human integrity and dignity. Irrespective of the minimal size and modest materials, they are manifestations of resistance, sabotaging the expressed disregard of the Nazi regime for human life. Their significance lies in their quality as tokens of defiance, personal or national identity, human values, and are as such major survival tools. Now, let me hand you back to my sister Oksana, who will continue her presentation on the development of the memorial at Gedenkstätte Ravensbrück. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrichu. After reunification, we could easily travel to the eastern part of Germany and visit the memorial site at Ravensbrück. Since then, my mother, Lida, and I have taken part in the anniversary of liberation almost every year. The remembrance of victims was held. <coughs> Sorry. The remembrance of victims was held at so-called Wall of Nations. The communists named sections according to the nationalities they recognized. However, countries like Ukraine or Israel remained unmentioned. A place for official reads was designated at the monument on the lake. At the anniversaries of a liberation, we met former prisoners from Ukraine, among them Vira Franco to the left, the granddaughter of Ivan Franco, and Irena Schul, right. However, there was no war for flowers for Ukrainian victims. Here you see Vira Franco next to the steamroller and our flowers at the execution site. Here. Another place we chose was the crematorium. 
In 2001, the Organization of Ukrainian Women from Munich visited Ravensbrück along with the Ukrainian bishop who read the Holy Mass in the former Zellenbau. Eventually, a new area was opened for a wider range of remembrance at the extension of the Wall of Nations. After 15 years of instigation, the state of Ukraine could install a memorial. My mother uncovered this plaque herself in memory of her Ukrainian inmates. It was her last visit to Ravensbrück before her passing in 2014. Unlike the Wall of Nations, the new memorial site honors not just groups, but also individual prisoners. Perhaps we can also organize a future project in honor to honor Ukrainian victims at Ravensbrück. Thank you very much for listening. And I would like to hand over to Mark Infeld. Yaku you, and thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I uh, am the grandson of uh, a woman, Daria Nakiska Lebed, and she was incarcerated in Ravensbrook with my mother, as well as my great grandmother, Oleksandra Natkivska, and my great aunt, as well as her daughter. My grandparents were members of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. In 1934, they were arrested for the assassination of the Polish interior minister. My grandfather was sentenced to death and my grandmother was sentenced to 15 years in prison. During this time, they were married in prison. And in 1939, when the German Blitzkrieg came through Poland, they both managed to escape their marching prison columns. They were reunited in, reunited in Slovakia, settled in Krakow until 1941. In 1941, June of 1941, Operation Barbarossa began the invasion of the Soviet Union by Germany. At this time, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists declared independence for Ukraine and immediately all became wanted men. The hunt for my grandfather began. Uh, my mother was born uh, in Lviv, Ukraine on September 22nd, 1942. And in 1944, on January 29th, the Gestapo found where they were hiding. In her memoir, my grandmother describes the event as follows. She wrote, we heard the roar of the entrance gate and the screams. The Gestapo are here. They broke through the main doors with a battering ram and rushed to our apartment. The Gestapo began beating us at will and ransacking the apartment because Mikola was not there. That made them very angry. We were taken into the yard. I overheard several Gestapo agents and the Unterstumpfjör state that finally these anti-German seeds would be destroyed. I was sure we were going to be shot. Instead, we were then ushered into a car and taken away. It was really only pure luck that my grandfather was not home at this time. The Germans waited for him to come home in vain, but Daria and him had made a plan so that he would know if it was safe or not to come home. The baby carriage that was left outside for my mother would have the top open if it was safe to come in or the top would be closed if it was not. She made sure to close the top of the carriage. Their underground intuition helped kept keep him alive. But my grandmother was tortured for 10 days straight. When they finally resigned themselves that she would not give up her husband, my mother and grandmother were put on a train for Buchenwald and then were taken to Robinsbrook. I will now read from the translated memoirs of Olha Froliak Eliashevska, prisoner number 49061. And I just want to thank her daughters, Christine and Lydia, for the translation and for allowing me to share this with you. 
Daria's elderly mother, Oleksandra Natkivska, stood in the row of prisoners during roll call. She lifted her eyes to the sky, a sufferer pleading to the Almighty. Remove this heavy stone from my forehead because it is breaking me. She clenched her fists tightly in despair. A sharp pain like hot burning coals pierced her heart. Bitter tears welled up in her throat, but refused to escape her eyes. She prayed and it appeared that in the thick morning mist, she saw her daughter Oda and her infant granddaughter Zoya. She stretched out her emaciated arms to touch them, to glance into their eyes, but they moved away as though distancing themselves on their way to meet their destiny. Alexandra shuddered in horror, raised her gray streaked head, looked again into the distance, still seeing their ghostly figures behind the dim cover of day. Daria, clutching her infant daughter Zoya in her arms, passed by quickly, hidden somewhere in the middle of the column of prisoners. The gates of the dark stone building, the bunker slammed shut. Hot tears streamed down Alexandra's face. She buried her face in her hands. Her body cringed and shuddered. A thin beam of sunlight broke through the morning sky, bathing the bunker in a strange golden light. Achtung, Alfrikstein! Shrill whistles, sharp commands, and loud barking, and the daily camp grind began again. The bunker where my mother and grandmother were held was Ravensbrook's most severe punishment, reserved for the most incorrigible prisoners. The building was located at the camp's entrance and was comprised of two floors with 39 cells each. The cells were the size of a closet, four and a half feet by two and a half feet. The most sadistic guards, like Dorothea Bins, ran this unit. My mother was kept in isolation for much of the time. When, and when I was young, uh, you know, my mother, she didn't really speak of uh, any of her experiences ever in Ravensbrook, except for once. Uh, when my siblings and I did not like what we were served for dinner, my mother told us how they had to share the food they had with the rats, otherwise they would have been eaten by them. My mother was one of the youngest children at Ravensbrook, and while the experience she had there was life-changing in a negative way, she was not wholly mistreated. At the same time she was there, Isa Vermeeren, a Protestant nun, as well as a um, artist was also incarcerated in the bunker. In her memoir, Journey Through the Final Act, she writes about my mother in detail. And I just wanna thank my uh, mother-in-law, Betty, for translating this from the German for me. This is from the book. There was also a small child in the cell block, little Soya, the only inmate without a definite sentence. When I came to the camp, she was so small, she had to be carried most of the time, for she was about one and a half years old. When she arrived in late autumn, we had to pay attention that she didn't run off. She was the daughter of the wife of a Ukrainian minister from the National Party, who together with her cousin, who happened to be in the house when she was taken prisoner, had been in Robinsbrook for half a year. The arrival of this little girl opened up so much good and bad that it is worthwhile to spend a moment discussing it. One always observes how much effect a small child has. The crudest men find a friendly word. A laugh comes from the most brutal situation. The most sinister thoughts brighten up when such an innocent, trustful creature is present. On a train trip through occupied France, I once sat in an overfilled section together with German officers and French civilians. In the middle stood a German Luftwaffe major whose shining officer's sword was near the nose of a small French child as he swung the child to and fro and the child naturally began to play with it. The mother attempted to stop him. She was the only one who was not hesitant to speak. All the others, German and French, took part in the game in some form by making noises grimaces, questions, and remarks. In that moment, they were mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters. They were friendly, they were human, and scarcely one had a second thought about the sense or necessity of the war. 
Freed from their former opinions by the innocence of the child, their hearts were free. At that time, this fortunate scene was undisturbed, but I learned by observing all the interactions with the little Zoya that it was false and only temporary. What a frightful amount of sentimentality was mixed into the behavior of most adults in the presence of this child. The helplessness of the child stirred them. The innocence of the child aroused comforting the unselfish conscious child made them so sad. Poor child, how good that you don't yet know how evil life is or something similar they would say to her. All the guards and inmates who encountered this child were nice to her, laughed with her, said something friendly, each one of them. So it seemed they took the trouble to show her their best side. Above all, the SS guards covered themselves with this niceness when they met the child. She was in no way an especially beautiful child, not especially lovable or clever, although everyone was ready to act as though she were. The sergeant went with her here and there, took her on the arm, spoke in a friendly and indulgent manner with her on the same way, laughed and seemed completely moved by the complete harmlessness of such a little one. But how rank and intentional all this was. At the same time, young Ukrainian women sat and wailed with complaining voices. Please, please, ma'am, I have done nothing, please, ma'am, while they were struck right and left behind the ears and were anxious and fearful for their lives. Was their helplessness really so basically different from the helplessness of this child? I believe that everyone is ready to help at whatever age and that most change only in a gradual sense. One must always hold the faith and trust in others, otherwise one is helpless. An actual change lies only in the area of personal responsibility as a child is not yet developed, oneself may have characteristics yet come into view. For the little Zoya herself, this time probably was foundational because no one aside from her mother earnestly took care of her. All she was used to, all that she expected was given to her. She always got from everyone what she wanted, bonbons or doll colored buttons. The prisoners who came almost daily into the cell block brought the most astonishing things the disinfecting room for laundry and clothing was in the basement. When the child was in the area, they all left their work on the laundry in order to play with her, to enjoy a friendly child view. One cannot easily describe what thoughts went through the hearts of these women, of whom the greater part had left behind their own small and grown children in the grayness of uncertainty. The two Ukrainians themselves had impressed me very much through their good behavior. They lived in two separate cells, but every day the cousin was led into the cell of the mother and child where the three of them clung together. Whenever I met them on a walk, they were as friendly to one another, lovable and courteous, as if they were seeing each other for the first time. Never a raised voice, never a harsh word. Such deeply grounded manners gave the impression that it was only right and simple to spend some time writing about them. Suddenly, one day, all three of them left unexpectedly. We never learned where they went, only that it would be better for them. But often when the Gestapo meant by better really sometimes meant they were murdered. I was taking a walk they were, when they were taken away and had to hold myself together to avoid breaking out in spontaneous grief. It was so sudden, taking three women away. They laughed, it is true, but the mother was deadly gray and shivered in her whole body. Also the cousin, if they wanted to say, it is all the same what they do to us, but the child, the child, who protects the child? That was long, I know. Um, but I think it's important to uh, understand um, what, uh, what a little girl was going through. Um, I said she wasn't mistreated. I do have one artifact here that I'd like to share with you. This little lamb was given to my mother by, the, uh, uh, by an SS guard to comfort her uh, while she was alone in her cell. And uh, my sister and I found this um, in the garbage uh, when we were clearing out my mother's house. I mean, I saved it. I just want to share that with you. The writings that I just read from you uh, by Isa Vermeeren are actually part of the reason why my mother was denied reparations from Germany. The German authorities cited this book for the denial of her claim, stating that she was a victim of military repression. 
Um, during this time, though, that you've I've read that she was being treated fine. The truth of the matter is, is that my grandmother was being tortured. Uh, they performed mock ex executions uh, to get her to talk, ruses uh, to get her to tell the Gestapo where my grandfather was, but she never broke. Um, she was a very, very strong woman. Uh, when they were freed, um, they hid in the Vatican for several years before, uh, in 1949, um, they came here under in, with false names. And I just wanted to share, if I can, with you some of the uh, pictures of, it doesn't look like I'll be able to share this, um, but I do have some photographs of them when they came out of um, Robinsbrook just shortly afterwards. I'd just like to conclude uh, a little bit of, to tell you about what my grandmother and mother were like. Uh, I knew my grandmother very well. She died on February 24th, 1989 from bladder cancer. My sister was sitting with her during her last moments. And in these seconds before she passed away, she was smiling and giggling. Boy, this woman was a real badass. She laughed in the face of death and she lived her life for the liberation of Ukraine. She was a loving and gentle woman. She loved to play cards all the time, but she was a terrible cook. Her food was horrible. My mother was an extremely beautiful, sophisticated and intelligent woman. She earned a master's degree in English from Columbia University where she met my father. She was a gourmet cook. She read incessantly. She was a very talented writer who wrote for Pittsburgh Magazine and had three cover stories published during that time. She was also a successful real estate agent. However, she was also a very, very troubled woman, prone to flights of fantastical fancy, extreme depression, loudish manipulation, financial terrorism, and chronic lying. She made outrageous claims like she dated George Harrison but at the same time, she was also very funny. She had many very uh, bad medical problems that were exacerbated by severe alcoholism and prescription drug addiction. At the end of her life, she managed to alienate everyone that she cared about, including her own children. She died alone at the age of 59 in 2002. Every day, I wish that I could have done more to help her but she lives on in the beautiful faces of my children. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I think now we, uh, Lida, will pass it on to you and see if there are any questions. I know we are running late, but um, perhaps there's a question or two that can be answered. Uh, hi, no, they're, oh, here, here they come. A message for Mark. Mark, thank you for sharing your story. That was incredibly moving. You're welcome. I left several things out because I'm afraid I'm just emotionally drained right now. Um, I am currently working on writing a book about all of this. It's called Subject D. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's also a message um, from, a, uh, from the audience. Um, I encourage the UCRDC to nominate the Ukrainian women of Robinsbrook for the Hero of Ukraine medal, posthumously awarded by the government of Ukraine. That's not really a question. It's just a statement from one of our audience. Interesting. So um, please feel free to write in your questions or comments where the panelists are here and we're ready. I'd just oh. like to say one other thing, if I could. Go ahead, Mark. But I just want everyone to know that I did attempt to visit Robinsbrook in 2018 
while we were in Germany, but I, I couldn't bring myself to go. And the people that I spoke with there had no records whatsoever of my mother or grandmother being there, which it's not surprising since much of it was, much of them were destroyed. Thank you, Mark. Um, here's a, here's a, um, a, a question from the audience. Will this webinar be available afterwards for people who were unable attend to attend? Apparently there were people trying to join um, that couldn't get on. So Kaleno, would, yes. would you answer that please? Sure. It's going to be on the Shochenko Scientific Canada as well as the UCRDC websites in about one to two weeks time. So anybody who couldn't listen in will be able to see it online. Thank you, Kaleno. Uh, there's a nice <clears throat> message for Oris and Oksana. Thank you from Lubajuk. Thank you for sharing these touching memories of your dear mother, Lida, our dear friend. Very moving and at the same time, distressing account of the experiences. Thinking of you and your dear mother, Luba Radoslau and Irene. Yeah. There's, there's more questions coming. What is the background on the illustrated publication on Ukrainian women at Ravensbrück? That is Pani Vitek uh, Vojtovic. She had, uh, well, I guess twice she had more published uh, her artwork. And uh, who, Oksana, you could probably talk about that, right? Uh, <clears throat> yes, just a moment. Uh, just to continue with, because the next question that okay. just popped up is. Oh, here I am. Oh, just, uh, just one moment, Oksano. The next question okay. that popped up is from Malta Wojtovic, who is the daughter of Olena Vitek. Hello. Thank you so very much, she comments. So uh, I would just like to say that we would love to get in touch with Malta Wojtovic. Go ahead, Oksano. Uh, so um, I'm really happy. Uh, uh, so you, you did join us. I just want to show this tiny, tiny book, which uh, was published at the end of the 40s in Munich. It's not written anything. It's written uh, about uh, which uh, editor or whatever. The, the only thing is, uh, it's for the for the care of of the former uh, prisoners. Uh, so this is the the small book which was re, um, redrawn in 1988. Um, so Ms. Yes. Uh, Wojtovic, maybe, uh, I think I'm quite sure uh, um, it's right. Uh, this is, um, the drawings were from 1988 and this, um, this book uh, was published in 1992. That's right. Um, it was, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Oksana. It was published at the, uh, in the United States in 1992. Right. And, uh, <laughs> we all have our copies. The small one was, was published at the end of the 40s, maybe 48, what, whatever. So both books are also at the Gedenkstätte Ravensbrück. My mother gave it, uh, from Olena Vita to Ravensbrück. Thank you, Oksano. Uh, um, maybe, I can, maybe I can add uh, for some uh, people who maybe uh, wouldn't know um, Olena uh, Vita Vojtovic, she was also uh, in, um, in Ravensbrück, and she was uh, also the artist of the miniatures my sister showed you before. Thank you, Oksana. Um, uh, another question, has anyone reached out to the Polish Research Institute at the Lund University, which holds the Ravensbrück archive? No, but I, I haven't, but if someone can uh, write to UCRDC and give me a link, 
to them, I'd be happy to do that because I'm looking for any sources that are still available. Okay. So um, I, um, I'll, I'll po post, the, um, post the email address for the documentation center shortly. Yes. Um, it's just office at ucrdc.org. So any other questions can actually be directed to the office there, and then I could uh, filter them to people who could possibly answer them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question, wondering if, if access has been gained to the official records at the German archives, as well as the government offices, German, as well as Austrian, which handled the forced labor compensation, which included details of incarceration and forced labor, along with copies of Osterbeiter documents. So this, this person is asking about access to official records at the German archives, as well as the government office, the German well, government I, offices. Kaleno or anybody? I've spoken, I've spoken to the Ravensbrück Museum uh, people, they are the ones that are collecting all the information about Rabin's book, and they have given me some references, but I'm not sure if they're in contact with any other organization. I mean, I can ask them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kaleno. Uh, another question for you, Kaleno, I believe. This is regarding the short film shown at the start of the presentation. Someone is asking, can you tell us more about this film and where it can be viewed? Is it an excerpt excerpt of a longer version? Thanks you, thank you everyone for the presentation today. Go ahead, Kaleno. Uh, no, it is actually in the references that we have on the UCRDC website. So the ref, it, it is there's a link to that film, and it's as I understand, standalone film. It's not a part of any other film. So if anybody's interested, please look at the references on the website and you will find the film there as well as two other films that are longer. Thank you, Kaleno. Oh, here's a very quite a long message from someone. Um, my mother was an Osterbeiter from Osterbeiter from 1940 to 1945, beginning when she was 18 years old. Thank you so much for your presentation and personal testimonies. I know how very difficult and emotionally devastating it is. My mother rarely spoke about her experience and I had to learn a lot on my own using the bad Erlson database and other sources. I'm also doing research on Ukrainian women forced laborers, a little known part of our history that even people in Ukraine don't know much about. There's another project waiting to happen. Anybody wanna answer, reply or comment? from the panel? No, okay. Um, well, here's a, an interesting comment from a, Danny Para. Thank you. My father, Roman Parash, Parashak, I apologize if I mispronounced, is Olena Vitek Wojtovic's cousin and would be interested. Oh, he is 98 years old. Like my sister mentioned, time is of essence. Any more questions? There's a lot of, oh, here, some more. Excellent presentation. We're in, in, indebted to UCRDC and all that have been researching and documenting this history, preserving historical memory and passing to future generations. From Zoriana and Yuri Luhovi from Montreal. Thank you, Yaku Yemo. So maybe one more and then it is, uh, we are running an hour and a half almost, so we should wind up. Uh, okay, there's just, uh, okay. Two. Oh, there's more. Yeah. Uh, Kaleno, <laughs> did, you, did you say it was the end? Sorry. Well, it is. And <laughs> their comments to UCRDC. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, um, just if I can add, I don't, you probably said so already, but um, um, 
uh, like Kaliana mentioned, we welcome further comments and questions and we encourage you to send them to our address at office at ucrdc.org using the subject title Ravensbrook. I hand it all back to you now, Kaleno Jakoyu. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We're approaching the end of the webinar, and I want to thank all of you for your attention as well as your questions. Uh, there is, we are thinking of perhaps running a modified version of this webinar in Ukrainian sometime in the future because we have been asked about this by a number of individuals. And I personally hope that this presentation has informed those who are not familiar with the extent that Ukrainian women suffered during the Second World War. And I also hope that publishing the Ravensbrook database, our community recognizes and pays tribute to the many Ukrainian women whose lives were disrupted and in many cases ended when they were imprisoned in Ravensbrook. And I wanna thank my co-presenters for their contributions in putting a human face on the women who were imprisoned at Ravensbrook. I want to thank the Podyaku Direkcji Naukowo Towarzystwa Imeny Szyłczenko w Kanadzie, jaki dali zmogą nam prowadzić ten webinar. Thank you za uwagę and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I Thank just want to also just share a picture of my mom I wasn't able to share during the presentation. And she is gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It was a very emotional evening and it's brought, brought back to many memories. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.